I think uh, Dr. Rajan is starting to speak. Uh, if uh, we can squeeze in a quick comment or two from uh, our guests here. Mr. Bansal, your first thoughts, sir? See, the, I think it's a case of missed opportunity. The, although the reduction in repo rate may not have translated into the reduction in the base rate, but the feel-good factor should, must have gone to the market and the banks would have been increased to reduce their base rate. Uh, this is the right time. I think uh, when uh, in September, uh, September 13, the uh, You know, we just wait for the, the press conference to get over. Dr. Rajan is starting to speak. Apologies for that, but let's cut across. Including in non-food items are temporary and whether the monsoon will continue to be near normal. We note the recent fall in oil prices, which will be very beneficial for India. As we await the transmission of our front-loaded fast actions, we will monitor developments for emerging room for more accommodation. Do you want me to say that again? <laughs> um, okay, I basically repeated our policy statement uh, saying that we're looking for whether the recent increase in inflation were temporary and whether the monsoon will continue to be near normal. Uh, the oil price development is very beneficial and we will await greater transmission of our past front-loaded actions while we look uh, and monitor developments for emerging room for more accommodation. Now, a couple of other uh, points I want to make uh, separate from the policy. Uh, the Reserve Bank is talking to the government about a medium-term framework for FPI limits in debt securities. Uh, this will include, one, a target for what fraction of the sovereign bond market will be constituted by FBIs in the medium term. Two, an announcement of staggered changes in limits every six months, with these being released on a monthly or quarterly basis. We have to determine that yet. Three, limits to be specified in rupees so that they do not vary with exchange rate movements. Four, the framework will create space for participation of different kinds of investors, which include long-term investors, such as pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, as well as our more usual medium-term investors, and uh, importantly, those coming through international central security depositories, such as Euroclear and Clearstream. The overall goal of this medium-term framework will be to enlist FPIs in market development within prudential limits that we set, even as they are attracted by rates available in Indian bonds. Once the framework is decided, we will wait for suitable market conditions, including possibly greater certainty about Federal Reserve actions and appropriate liquidity conditions in Indian markets before making a public announcement. Second announcement, the RBI has received recommendations from the External Advisory Committees on Payment Banks, chaired by Dr. Nachiket Moore, and on Small Finance Banks, chaired by Ms. Usha Thorat. Now an internal committee of the RBI, composed of DGs and the Governor, is going through each of these applications again. Finally, a set of recommendations will be presented to the RBI Board, which will decide the final as I said before, I hope to announce at least one set of bank licenses before the end of this month. I should also add that I've received the report of the High Part Committee on Urban Cooperative Banks, the PJ Nayak Committee report, and the Nachiket Moore reports. I believe this uh, report will inform our actions in the months to come on urban cooperative banks. Uh, it will be put out for public comment shortly. Let me end by talking about something about which there's been a lot of commentary in the press. Uh, there has been a lot of commentary about the composition of the Monetary Policy Committee. Let me start by saying that the RBI believes institutionalizing the process of monetary policy formulation is vital, given that the government has given the RBI a clear inflation objective. We've already done a lot internally in the past, uh, in, in my term and before, to institutionalize the process, including having scheduled meetings with different constituencies before the policy decision, 
having serious discussions with internal staff based on incoming economic data and based on our model analysis, and speaking with the government to obtain its viewpoint. The final policy is usually a consensus arrived at by the governor, the deputy governor in charge of monetary policy, and the executive director in charge of monetary policy. But ultimately, the responsibility is the governor's. Going forward, there are at least three virtues of taking the decision away from the governor and giving it to a committee. First, a committee can represent different viewpoints, and studies show that its decisions are typically better than an individual's. Second, spreading the responsibility for the decision can reduce the internal and external pressure that falls on an individual. Third, a committee will ensure broad monetary policy continuity when any single member, including the governor, changes. So we have been enthusiastic supporters of the idea of a committee. Since the finance minister's budget announcement that such a monetary policy committee would be formed, we have been engaged in dialogue with the government. From the RBI's side, we wanted to ensure the structure should ensure continuity in policy as the market attempts to understand the voting patterns of new MPC members. I can reiterate the finance secretary's comment yesterday that the government and RBI have reached a broad consensus on what such a committee should look like and what the powers of the governor should be. While the details have to be ironed out, there are no differences between the government and the RBI in this matter. Happy to take questions. Uh, morning, Governor Lata from CNBC TV 18. Uh, since you say that a committee is better and that you have been enthusiastic supporters of the committee, should we therefore understand that you are okay with not having a casting vote or a veto power in that committee? Uh, secondly, uh, co coming to the pol policy itself, uh, uh, you've lowered by the Jan-March inflation uh, uh, pr trajectory by 0.2 basis points, but your Jan 2016 inflation stands at 6%. Is there even a downward bias to it, uh, to that 6% uh, f uh, forecast? Uh, finally, on NPLs, do you really believe the numbers put out by the banks, uh, or do you think the situation is a lot worse? Okay. Um, I was trying to list all your questions. Uh, let's, let's start with uh, um, the Monetary Policy Committee. The details will be made public when the government feels comfortable, and uh, I, I think we should await that rather than talk about the details. I will only talk about the veto issue, which uh, has gained some uh, public uh, discussion. Um, I mean, currently the situation is the governor has the veto. That's effectively uh, all advice is only advice. Ultimately, the decision is the governor's. So if we continue to retain a veto, it doesn't change the, the current situation. It maintains the status quo. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but let, on the rest of the issues, uh, I think, why don't we await the formal announcement of the committee propo <coughs> proposal? After all, the, this will have to eventually go into a, a, a change in the RBI Act, which requires legislative change, so it requires parliamentary approval, et cetera. Uh, on the uh, second question of, uh, of the forecast, can I ask uh, Urjit to speak about it while I drink some water? <clears throat> you know, the, the forecast for, uh, for early next year, uh, and indeed the, uh, the time between now and then, uh, has been updated, as we always do, uh, given that we had two uh, data points that came in after the June policy. Uh, and the reasons for uh, for for get for making the central estimate projection lower are well known, um, uh, and and therefore that's what it reflects. Uh, we have always said that these things are data dependent, and this is an example that it is data dependent. Uh, Jan 2016 forecast itself. Uh, has it at least a downward bias? Is all I'm asking. At the moment, the risks are balanced. But as you know, the fan chart is a confidence interval, uh, so you would find in that broad funnel 
numbers which would be below six. Thank you. Um, on your third question on NPAs, uh, there are a number of checks and balances on uh, uh, trying to ensure that the NPAs that are announced are the true and fair picture. Um, we also supervise banks and go into their portfolios to see whether they've declared all the NPAs uh, they should. And we examine divergences, and bank management is hauled up if there are divergences. Now, going forward, uh, I think the key question is how does stress in the banking system play out? There are some important areas that are stressed. The power sector is one, steel sector is another. Uh, we are certainly uh, monitoring that process um, and uh, trying to urge uh, that restructuring, if it went done, is deep, is uh, appropriate, so that projects are put back on track. I think that is what we need for the continuing health of the, uh, not just the banking system, but the economy. Bijoy? Governor Bijoy from Kajansis. A uh, couple of questions, because you mentioned that uh, rupee-linked uh, debt limits, will they be marked to market or will they be pegged to a certain limit, uh, a level, um, a certain rupee or dollar level? On the liquidity front, the RBI has indicated that they, that there seems to be comfortable liquidity in the system. But at this point, did you all have any temptation to go for an SLR cut or an HTM calendar, which would also pave more way for the, you know, the LCR requirement? And domestic systemically important banks were, the names are supposed to come out this month. Do you think it's a good time considering the capital stress that the banks find themselves under? Right. Um, on the um, um, SLR liquidity issue, uh, I think the uh, right now we still have some way to go before the uh, HTM and SLR balance. Uh, once that happens, we take, can take a further view as to whether there would be, uh, you know, when the uh, future SLR cuts will come. Undou undoubtedly, SLR will keep coming down over time till it reaches a more comfortable uh, level. But when is something we have to determine. Uh, your first question was? Limits. Yeah, uh, limits are going to be set in terms of, as I said, a progression eventually to that target uh, where we think we are comfortable with as a, you know, the fraction of FPIs uh, of the bond market. Um, that limit will change from dollars to rupees now, but obviously it will bear some relationship to the current rupee investment that already is there. And it will be incremental based on that. Uh, so uh, I think it will move up from, from there uh, on a reasonable basis, as I've announced. It will be a limit. I mean, we will change the limit. As I said, it will be pegged to a rupee level. So, for example, just uh, if I say today it is uh, 2 lakh crores, it can be 2 lakh 20 tomorrow, uh, and uh, that 2 lakh 20 will be independent of the le rupee dollar level. So it will be how much do you invest in rupees, which is the more sensible way of doing it, because after all, the investing in rupee instruments. Uh, on the third issue, perhaps, uh, uh, the third issue was... Yeah, uh, this framework by, we have had announced, and before the month end, we have to uh, declare the names. The work is going on. We'll come back on that. Anupriya, please, please speak in the mic, into the mic. Uh, good morning, Rajan. Um, two questions. Uh, first, on inflation, you've uh, mentioned that the near term household inflation expectations have gone back again into double digits. Uh, and that's become a problem. On the other hand, we've had WPI, which is in negative territory for eight months. What's that divergence signaling to you right now? Because there have been some papers indicating that maybe all price indications should be looked at. Secondly, sir, because we've had a lot of different growth indicators. We've got the IIP, which is very volatile. You've got, you know, core sector, which is all over the place, and GDP. The skepticism continues. Uh, what are the growth the parameters that the RBI is looking at when you're making your assessment to say that economic recovery uh, is progressing, is work in progress? What are the key indicators that the RBI is looking at at this point, sir? Okay. Um, on the first issue of uh, um, inflationary expectations, inflationary expectations do get altered considerably by certain salient uh, items, such as food, 
milk, uh, um, various components of foods are more salient than others, vegetables, for example. So given that, yes, it is a concern, but uh, it's, uh, one should you know, keep it in that perspective. It's one of the factors we're looking at. When you look at WPI inflation, uh, a significant part of WPI inflation is the commodity disinflation that has happened, and in some cases, commodity deflation. This is more globally determined. Now, one of the problems with focusing on WPI alone was it left out the entire service sector, or large parts of the service sector, focused largely on traded goods, which is primarily beyond our control, uh, except via the exchange rate, and neglected non-traded goods in India. So it's very convenient to look at WPI because then you can do all your uh, inflation management based on the work of others outside. Uh, and only a very small part of it is because of your own eff efforts. Uh, if we really want to manage inflation, we have to look at the sum total of inflation, especially the inflation that confronts consumers, because that's what determines things like household savings behavior. It determines the wage pressures that will come, and therefore CPI inflation seems to us much better. And we can't keep shifting from one index to another depending on what is more comfortable. There are people who make the argument that WPI being so low uh, that is the real rate, uh, when they look at the real rate that they face, they have to, in a sense, add the WPI deflation to the nominal interest rate to get the real rate that they face. That's not, that's not right. When you look at firms, you're seeing that even though their top line is not growing that strongly, a number of firms are reporting bottom line growth. Why is that? Because even while they lose out in the ability of pricing on the output side, the input costs are also falling. So as a result, profitability may in fact be increasing. It's the rate of inflation of profitability rather than the rate of inflation of your output prices, which is more important, to understand whether what, what is the appropriate rate that the firms are facing. Regardless, we've said again and again, what we really need to do is bring inflation down so that both the producer as well as the consumer, the saver and the investor, both feel, uh, all of them feel comfortable. That's what we engaged in. What are the parameters that you're looking at while assessing doing your growth uh, outlook, sir? <clears throat> you know, the, uh, we look at a variety of uh, both low frequency and high frequency indicators since, uh, since we have to make this statement every two months, and some of them are listed. Uh, we do look at the PMI, which gives a, uh, a slightly forward-looking uh, diagnosis of the situation, car sales, uh, freight traffic, uh, etc., uh, because they are important indicators of ultimate and down-the-stream activity. So those are the th uh, those are the, the indicators that we use, uh, uh, including the, the the national ones like the IIP core and the quarterly GDP numbers, nominal credit growth as well. Uh, sir, आपने uh, para 16 में चार points बताए हैं जिनके ऊपर आगे का आपका action depend करेगा. जिसमें uh, inflationary expectation है, monsoon है, Fed है और transmission है. जाहिर uh, है कि ये सारी clarity आने में दो महीने लगे ऐसा जरूरी नहीं है. तो अगर बीच में आपको clarity दिखती है क्या mid policy action आप देख रहे हैं. और मेरा दूसरा सवाल है आपने जो indicate किया है कि export कम होने के दो वजह हैं. एक कि global demand घटी है. दूसरे कई दूसरे देशों में जो उनका रेट है करेंसी के रेट है वो ज्यादा डिप्रीशिएट हुए हैं रुपी के मुकाबले तो क्या आप रुपी की जो आपकी कंफर्ट बैंड है उसको इसी वजह से लोअर करते जा रहे हैं क्योंकि हम देख रहे हैं कि एक ग्रेजुअल डिप्रीशिएशन दिखाई दिया है फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन यू नो वी आर वेटिंग इंफॉर्मेशन देयर वाज मोर नीड टू मूव फास्ट in the early stages of the turnaround, we will take all the information into account and decide whether, you know, at times uh, it warrants moving in between policy cycles or it doesn't. Generally, you know, early stages of the, uh, you know, turnaround in monetary policy 
uh, there's probably more need to do that than at later stages. There's already been monetary policy announcements for some time, so it's more uh, reasonable to go back to a pattern uh, during some times. But nobody ever rules out any actions that the central bank can take. I mean, it's, it's one of the options that we always have. Um, on the um, uh, second question of the exchange rate, uh, we don't really have a target band at any point in time. Uh, the exchange rate moves because of a variety of uh, factors, including uh, news about what the likely current account deficit is going to be. Uh, one of the reasons for the strength of the rupee in recent times versus other emerging markets is because of the falling price of oil and therefore the shrinking uh, current account deficit. Um, we do monitor factors like the competitiveness uh, of Indian industry, which is not just a function of the exchange rate but a variety of other factors. Uh, we look at, uh, you know, uh, relative uh, rates relative to some of the other regions and so on. But put all that together, our intervention in markets is, again, primarily to reduce volatility rather than to try and target a particular level. So I wouldn't say we have target bands. Dr. Rajan, uh, what is your view on the independence of Central Bank uh, on the backdrop of IFC code uh, released recently? And uh, is there any concern related to it? I think the um, you had an article by the former finance minister in the newspapers a couple of days ago. Uh, and he has been finance minister for a long time, so he, and given that he's out of government now, he feels comfortable in, in, in talking about it. Uh, I think there's been healthy respect uh, between the government and the central bank, and um, the central bank ultimately decides what the course of monetary policy will be. Uh, of course, it is, uh, it seeks out and gets information from the government on how the government sees the situation, and that factors into monetary policy decisions. Now, um, there are various attributes of independence that academic economists have used, and to some extent, uh, I would argue those attributes are probably not as present in India as elsewhere. For example, fixed terms for central bank uh, uh, governors and deputy governors, existence of a monetary policy committee, things like that. Uh, but I would say uh, de facto independence, uh, including in the kinds of people that historically the government has appointed as RBI governors, uh, as well as the space it gives them. See, the government in India has the right to give direction to the Reserve Bank of India and tell it what it should do. There's a clause in the Reserve Bank of India Act. That direction has never been given in the history of the RBI. So you have to distinguish what is uh, de jure from what is de facto. And I think de facto, the RBI is independent. Uh, you talked about a comfortable level of SLR. So could you uh, elaborate uh, what would be the comfortable level of SLR that you have in mind and what is the time frame that you'll uh, w want to have it by? See, this is an evolving, uh, e evolving issue. What is clear is that government bonds should find an open market and not, be, uh, not have a captive market which is forced to invest in them. There will be a level of government securities that banks will want to hold because of liquidity, because of safety, because of protection, etc. Uh, you can see across the world, banks, you know, generally, even when there are no constraints, do hold some level of government securities. So we have to move towards that level, uh, partly because, uh, you know, it is important that the government bond market be uh, sort of freed up. But partly also banks need to be freed up to do what is most important, for example, credit to the, uh, the uh, non-government sector. So, so I think this is uh, an evolving picture, and uh, we will know as, as time goes on. 
Uh, most people would argue it is significantly below where we are right now. But the time frame over we, which we reach that, we have to be careful because we have to ensure we don't disrupt the government bond market as we go towards that point. Uh, can I have ask one more question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this is regarding the cost of funds and uh, transmission that, uh, uh, see, a lot, a lot, not all banks have reduced lending rents over a period since they have reduced policy rates. And uh, one se segment of borrowers through NBFCs, they are not benefited out of, directly benefited out of uh, rate cuts. So how would you help them get a better price? See, uh, the good thing about monetary policy as uh, Governor Stein of the Federal Reserve said, is it gets into every crack. So over time, in fact, what we see today is transmission is not happening as much through the banks as through money market rates. Money market rates have come down significantly because of the RBI action. Those money market rates feed into the rates at which, say, NBFCs borrow, at the rates at which they issue commercial paper. So. I think that rates eventually feed into everybody. They all get the benefit of, of low rates and, and therefore have to pass it on. Good morning, Governor. Gabriel Palestine from the Wall Street Journal. Um, so we've seen that uh, the MPA problem uh, at Indian banks is uh, kind of slow to go away and it looks pretty persistent. Uh, you say here uh, that you're seeing loan demand picking up in the third quarter of this year. Now, I would like to know uh, if you think whether uh, you think that um, the the problem with the uh, loan demand um, is a demand problem or a supply problem in the Indian economy. I.e., if you've had news of uh, companies that are starved for credit and cannot get it from banks. And also, um, I would like to know if you, um, what's your, you say that you welcome the uh, announced government uh, injection of capital into um, state-run banks. Uh, how much more do you think uh, those banks will need um, by the end of 2019? Uh, and um, uh, how do you see the, uh, uh, the, the help that the government is going to give them uh, unfolding in the, in the coming two, three years? Thank okay. you. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Gandhi to respond on the amount of capital that's that's required, um, and perhaps Mr. Mundra also. Uh, the on the issue of uh, uh, demand versus supply, you're asking the question of the ages, right? Uh, there's always a question that is asked: Is it the banks that are proving too tight, or is it the borrowers who are not coming to ask? If you ask the banks, they'll say no borrowers are coming. If you ask the borrowers, they say the banks are too tight. Uh, in any uh, sort of beginning phase of the recovery, this discussion always goes on. And, and I think what happens is that, uh, you know, over time, as the opportunities that are brought to banks look more attractive, uh, and as uh, deposit growth picks up and the banks have funds that they need to invest, uh, you will see both factors happening. The opportunities will look more attractive and the uh, terms will get a little less, uh, less onerous. Um, I would say today it's hard to argue that the large firms, healthy large firms, have difficulty in accessing credit. Uh, they certainly can go to the commercial paper markets, but the banks too are looking for good credits to, to lend to. Uh, small and medium-sized enterprises always have difficulty, and the difficulty because of liquidity constraints in the recent past uh, may in fact be higher because they haven't received their payments from, uh, from people who owe them money and so on. That is an issue we need to we need to continue looking at and see how we can resolve it. Uh, but it, I, I would say that uh, for now, I'm not overly perturbed about tightness in credit flow. Uh, my sense is that as the projects come up, uh, they will find financing, especially given that the capital situation of the banks has improved somewhat. But on the capital issue, let me let me ask Mr. Gandhi and Mr. Mundra. On the capital, it all depends upon the assumptions that we make. Two years before, when we gave uh, guidance to banks and the uh, government also, at the time the bank sector was growing very fast. 
So now the growth has been uh, slowed down to 13, 14 percent corrected growth. So depending upon the current uh, level of growth, we have indicated that about uh, 140,000 crores uh, capital may be needed. So government has announced its intention to uh, support the banks, the public sector banks, by 70,000 crores. So in any case, it will be constantly be uh, looked at depending upon uh, year because it is a long process up to 2018. So every year we have we have to relook at the figure based on the conditions prevailing at that point in time. As of now, it looks good. No, just to add, uh, you must have seen that while infusing the capital, uh, the, the calculation which is done uh, uh, by the government is uh, something like 1 lakh 80,000 crore. Uh, assumption is 12 percent credit growth for the current year and 15 percent credit growth for the rest of the part. But as uh, uh, Governor and Mr. Gandhi also mentioned, these are moving targets. Uh, how the growth in economy picks up, uh, also the profitability and the ability of banks to retain profit. I think all these factors would uh, need to be factored in as we move further. But range must be visible to you, uh, something like one lakh fifty thousand crore to two lakh fifty thousand crore over a period of uh, uh, the implementation. That is what looks to be range at this point of time. Ladies and gentlemen, in the audio conference, if you wish to ask a question, may press star and 1 on your touchstone telephone. Participants are requested to only use handsets while asking a question. We have the first question from the line of Radhika from Hindu Business Line. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Um, this is one uh, question I had. Uh, Historically, if we see, there has always been a gap between the RBI's rate actions and the bank's uh, lending rates. I mean, even if we take the period between 2008 to 9 or 12 to 13, uh, the reduction in lending rates have always been far lower than the reduction in the policy rate. So when you say that any future action will be contingent on a full transmission this time around, what do you think has changed or is different this time that will allow banks to um, really cut the full, you know, 75 basis points on the lending rate. I, I think that's a misunderstanding. We didn't say full transmission. Further transmission is, is what we said, and, and transmission takes place over time. Um, what is important to remember is monetary policy is not like a lever that you press immediately and immediately you get action. There's about three, three to four quarters lag between when rates are cut and when the effects are seen in the economy. So uh, we started cutting rates in January. I would start seeing the effects of the rate cut only in October, September, October, November. And this is something people have to remember when they look at rate cuts. We have to forecast what is going to happen in the economy three to four quarters down the line, not what is happening currently in the economy in order to gauge the impact of any rate action that we take. So we are fully uh, sort of cognizant of the fact that transmission takes place slowly through the banks, but that further beyond that into real activity takes a little more time. What the rate cut does is give a signal, which is why the market gets optimistic or pessimistic depending on the rate cut or the lack of it, but that signal then starts plans. The plans then fructify down the line. When those investment plans fructify, you get more uh, activity at that point. So there is a lag three to four quarters. What we should be looking for now is the effects of the rate cut that started in January. They should start coming, uh, you know, as, as we go forward, and, and that's what we will be seeing soon. Uh, two last questions from this room, Joel and Roshan. Thank you, madam. I'm Joel Rebello. I work for Mint newspaper. Uh, according to an analysis we have done, uh, about more than about 50% of the loans, NPAs from industries are from uh, metals, you know, power infrastructure and commodity links. Is RBI worried about this, uh, you know, so-called concentration of NPAs from a particular area or a particular sector? Uh, I also want to push you on Lata's question. Uh, Lata asked you about uh, NPAs. Do you do you really believe the bank numbers, or do are we are we here? I mean, could we see more skeletons? out of the cupboard. Also, are you under pressure to say that, you know, NPAs, uh, not call NPAs NPAs? Uh, okay. 
Um, so, um, you know, certain sectors are going to be hit. There are two sources of, of uh, at least current stress. One is the global overcapacity. And certainly you can see that in ferrous but also non-ferrous metals, that global overcapacity, uh, especially the huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, discrepancies in, in China are affecting uh, countries over, across the world, including India. So that's one source of stress. Uh, second source of stress is power. In fact, power is probably the more important stress, and that is less external factors, more domestic factors. Uh, a central factor in the power stress is these uh, power distribution companies. If they get resolved in a more permanent way, then that would alleviate some sources of stress in the power sector. So our focus is how can we resolve the distribution company stress in a proper way uh, uh, so that we can, we can get power purchases going in a, in a more, more effective way. Um, you asked uh, whether we uh, believe the bank numbers. Uh, we inspect the banks. And we ferret out situations where the NPAs are not, you know, uh, where, where something that is standard is not an NPA. These are called divergences. And some banks, there are more divergences than others, in which case they have a pretty strong uh, discussion with Mr. Mundra here, uh, in which he hauls, the, hauls them over the coals for what, doing what they did. And increasingly, uh, we are turning towards actually taking action on such, uh, such divergences. So... Uh, it's not that these things go, uh, you know, uh, get done with impunity. There are, of course, uh, in a stressed environment, situations where sometimes uh, uh, projects are lent to when, in fact, they are better, uh, you know, either closed or restructured in a significant way. Our recent actions are attempts to get all players uh, on the same platform to discuss how to put the project back on track in a significant way. And this requires effort by both the banker, the promoter, state governments, central governments, regulators, uh, you know, electricity, tariff, etc., for it to really work. And that is why we have been much less keen on forbearance going forward and saying, face up to the reality, you need to do what you need to do, take the medicine, pushing it into the future is going to just create bigger problems in, in the future. There's always a discussion of these issues uh, because there's a thin line between forbearance and flexibility. We have said we are for flexibility, where if, for example, sometimes there's only a little more to uh, develop in a project, and then it can start producing revenues. In that situation, should a bank lend into that project even if the project is NPA, in order to complete it and put it back on track. We have said no problem in lending to a project which is an NPA, so long as it is meant not to evergreen, but to put the project back on track and get it going. Similarly, 525 rule uh, that sometimes is derided. We are actually examining 525 cases to make sure it's used for the right purpose. The point is not so much, again, to postpone problems into the future, to postpone repayment way into the future. In fact, we are insisting that there shouldn't be significant moratoria on repayment in the 525 rule. The point, however, is to ensure that what was structured as repayment in a short while for a long project can be extended. So where there is genuine reason to believe it's a long project, extend it. So that kind of debate always takes place. Industry will say, please extend, please this thing. And we have to take a decision and, on whether this is forbearance, which we don't want to do, of flexibility, which may be warranted in order to get the project back on track. Again, the primary force is getting it back on track rather than postponing the problem to the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Ushang from Z Business. Uh, so my question is uh, on, uh, uh, you know, what's your stand in terms of uh, the common KYC for all financial products? Apart from that, uh, uh, so w what's your stand on, uh, you know, increasing the limit for the payment wallets, which is currently at 10,000, uh, capped at 10,000 without KYC? And uh, final will be on uh, the status of the small and the payment bank licenses. Uh, 
common KYC is a work in progress already by, by work is going on among all the regulators. We have uh, identified a common um, set of information or application kind of that is uh, getting uh, work is going on, some test uh, also going on. Afterwards, we will finalize it. No, the e-wallet is something which is catching up very fast and we are constantly reviewing that and that will get a push when payment banks come. So we'll review uh, based on how things are evolving. But certainly we'll review the limits. And we have already uh, got three ca categories where we have up to 50,000 also you can go with to full KYC. Uh, so just to just a backbencher question from us, from Reuters, sir. Just wanted to understand uh, what is your what is the stance on liquidity? Uh, liquidity? Are you kind of trying to keep it little less than the one percent, uh, easier than the one percent stated deficit? And uh, what uh, on what circumstances, sir, will you use OMO sales as a, as an instrument to drain liquidity? Thank you. You know we have. Uh, uh, we have modulated liquidity to be as close to the policy rate as possible, and we have explained in the in the statement itself uh, uh, that over May, June, and July, different actions using the full gamut of instruments that are available to us have been used. Uh, we have uh, we have ensured that there are comfortable liquidity conditions, so that uh, so that it helps the transmission, uh, and uh, going forward. Uh, we are trying to. We will be trying to keep uh, to keep the, uh, the the call money and the and the broader money market rate as close to the policy rate as possible. Um, sorry, sorry, Suvarshi. Thanks, thanks. Very much.